श्री कृष्ण जन्माष्टमी महोत्सव की जय सो ऑफ कोर्स वी ऑल नो कृष्ण हैज ऑलरेडी अपीयर्ड वी आर लिटिल लेट बट इट्स ऑलवेज ऑस्पिशियस टू ग्लोरीफाई द लॉर्ड्स एक्टिविटीज मे बी टुनाइट वी कैन रीड फ्रॉम भगवद गीता एज इट इज दिस इज द ट्रांसलेशन एंड कॉमेंटरी बाय हिज डिवाइन ग्रेस ए सी भक्ति विदांत स्वामी प्रभुपाद फाउंडर ऑफ चार्ज ऑफ द इंटरनेशनल सोसाइटी फॉर कृष्ण कॉन्शियसनेस So in chapter 4 there's a famous verse uh, text number 9 well known verse those of you who know it you can chant along uh, with me janma karma chame devyam evam yo veti tatvatah jatva deham punar janma naiti maneti sorjana and that means that one who knows the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities does not upon leaving the body take his birth again in the material world but attains my eternal abode o arjuna a purport the lord's descent from his transcendental abode is already explained in the 6th verse which we might as well read ajopi sanavya yatma bhutana mishwaropi san prakritim swam adhishthaya sambhavami atma mayaya although i am unborn this is krishna speaking although i am unborn and my transcendental body never deteriorates and although i am the lord of all living being uh, living entities i still appear in every millennium in my original transcendental form so shila prabhat comments on today's verse that the lord's descent from his transcendental abode is already explained in the 6th verse which we just read one who can understand the truth of the appearance of the personality of god is already liberated from material bondage and therefore he returns to the kingdom of god immediately after quitting this present material body such liberation of the living entity from material bondage is not at all easy the impersonalists and the yogis attain liberation only after much trouble and many many births even then the liberation they achieve merging into the impersonal brahma jyoti or the lord is only partial and there is a risk of returning to this material world but the devotees simply by understanding the transcendental nature of the body and activities of the lord attain uh, attain the abode of the lord after ending this body and i'm sorry the devotee simply by understanding the transcendental nature of the body and activities of the lord attains the abode of the lord after ending this body and does not run the risk of returning to the material world in the brahma samhita it is stated that the lord has many many forms and incarnations advaita machita manadim anant roopam although there are many transcendental forms of the lord they are still one and the same supreme personality of god it one has to understand this fact with conviction although it is incomprehensible to mundane scholars and empiric philosophers so how do we understand krishna here it's a notable word here in this verse tatvataha what does tatvataha mean in fact in truth and we notice those who have read bhagavad gita a little bit you can notice that krishna actually repeats this word quite a few times with reference to this idea of understanding the supreme lord and the necessity of understanding him one actually has to actually understand him not just in theory but in fact so how does one factually understand the supreme lord anybody know the hint is given by the lord himself a couple of times in bhagavad gita and jai keshava prabhu will recite the verse uh, as the praman that uh, proves this what is it very good krishna says in chapter 18 bhakti amam abhijanati one can understand me as i am tatvataha um by devotional service so it is not just by book knowledge that one can understand god one can understand the nature the transcendental nature of krishna just by studying the shastras one actually has to understand krishna by the process that krishna himself recommends and in the bhagavad gita krishna says it very clearly if you want to understand me you have to be only my devotee can understand me what else does he say bhakto si me sakhateti rahasyam he tadutamam because you're my devotee he tells arjuna therefore you're the fit candidate to understand me so this is the p- 
pivotal point, actually, in which we can approach God. If we want to understand Krishna or make sense of his appearance in this world, understand how it actually transpires, we actually have to adopt this process of devotional service because he reserves the right of not revealing himself to those that he doesn't care to reveal himself to. In fact, we also reserve this right too, don't we? <laughs> if we don't like someone, we're going to remain closed to that person. He won't really be able to get in. Um, so Krishna is like this because he's the supreme person. We have this fear that uh, if someone, is a, someone has personality, it means he has to be flawed because our only experience is that personality has flaws. But Krishna is not like that. Krishna is in fact a flawless personality. And for that reason, he's very difficult to understand. We can't calculate or manipulate Krishna in, uh, in, in dealing with him. We actually have to approach him on his terms. And if we do that, <clears throat> if we engage in devotional service to Krishna, then through direct experience, this is the key word, experience, through personal experience, we actually begin to get the insight as to what's really going on here when Krishna himself comes into this world. And for that matter, when Krishna comes into this world, uh, we read uh, verse 6 already, ajopi san avyayatma bhutanam ishvaropi san prakritim swam adhishtaya sambhavami atma mayaya. Krishna says, I uh, advent myself into this material world every age after age after age. And I do so by Atma Maya, by my own personal energy. Uh, even though I'm unborn, and even though my transcendental uh, personality is avyaya, undi undiminishing. Vyaya means uh, disintegration, or um, um, it, it, it is not temporary. It's a, t it's a uh, I'm sorry, it's not eternal, it's a temporary thing. Vyaya means it's subject to decay. Krishna's body is not subject to decay because Krishna's body is what the Brahma Samhita calls Satchit Ananda Vigraha. Our body is made out of what? According to Sankhya analysis, our body is made out of earth, water, fire, air, and ether. That's, Sankhya, that's an outdated analysis because nobody speaks in these terms anymore. Nowadays, people talk in terms of amino acids, and fat, and so many proteins, and so many other things. But basically, these are the five elements that the body is made out of. But Krishna's body is different than that. Now there's another distinction between ourselves and Krishna, our bodies and Krishna, in that Krishna is his body. <laughs> we are not our bodies. What's the proof that we are not our bodies? Well, for example, uh, modern science tells us, you can confirm anybody who's a scientist here, um, that the, every cell in your body will change in, let's say, every decade or so. Is this correct or no? Every seven years, they say. Whether it's true or not, I don't really know, but they say like that. But I can remember things that I was doing even 45 years ago. When I was four, five years old, we had a lemon tree in my backyard because it's California, you have lemon trees there. And I was swinging uh, without a care in the world from the branches of that lemon tree. And then one day they came out and said, tomorrow you have to go to school. <laughs> and then I thought, oh, school, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> and then they said, you have to learn new things. And I said, okay. Well, then of course you all know, with the first day of school, when you bring the kids to school, what happens? You have a room full of wailing little toddlers. It's a very sad event. <laughs> and from that point on, you have to work hard all the way until you're 20 something, right? And if you want to get a PhD, you go even longer than that. So anyway, this is, um, I'm getting diverted here. But the point is that we are not this material body. Otherwise, we would not, we would, the memory would decay as well. Of course, the memory does decay. <laughs> That's another thing. Our Buddhist friends, they also believe in reincarnation, but they do not believe in the existence of the Atma, or the self, the soul. Or rather, they define it a little bit differently. What do they say? Well, they say the Atma is basically the mind, the intelligence, and the false ego, and it doesn't go any further than that. 
And ultimately, even the Atma, they recognize the mind, the intelligence, and the false ego. These things are also morphing very slowly over time into something other than what they started with. People change very slowly, but they do change. And if we were the mind uh, or the body, it would not be so. The very fundamental pivot of the philosophy of uh, Vedanta or Krishna consciousness is given by Krishna in chapter 2 when he says that those things that are real, they don't decay, and those things that are false, they don't endure. Even in this relative world, things that are considered to be classical, what, what, are, the, what are their characteristics? They withstand the test of time. And in fact, they tr their, their appeal transcends space as well. So, you know, across geographic borders and over many millennia, over many centuries even, you know, class, things that are considered to be classical, they, they, they maintain. So anything that is of value, really of value, it does not end. So the thing which is of ultimate value, the self, that is actually eternal. And we can actually realize this. When we become unconscious, we actually don't become unconscious. What's the proof of that? Because the ear is always active, the ear is always working, and even when you're asleep, if you hear something loud enough, it will wake you up. The consciousness has, has been double-clicked, it's been minimized, but the program is still running. That's basically how it works, you see? So this is the proof that we are not our material body. We are not this mind-body complex. Although, because of attachment, and because of our desire, we are definitely very much absorbed in this material body. That absorption, that misidentification is the cause of all of our suffering in this world and in fact it's the cause of our repeated transmigration from one body to another within this worldly existence. We have a very dogged determination to maintain uh, an, an independent attitude and, and, and a spirit of independence from the Supreme Lord. We want to become autonomous. Basically, in essence, we want to become the Lord Himself. And because of this attitude, we are impelled to maintain our position in um, favoring material existence. Within material existence, we cannot maintain any position, but we can eternally maintain the position of remaining in material existence. Is that making sense? In other words, if you, if you like, you can stay in this material world forever, but the catch is that you cannot stay in any particular specific position forever in this material world. Prabhupada was in South India one day. He went to this Andhra conference. <laughs> it was in, I guess it was in, it must be in Hyderabad or something. So Prabhupada said, now in this life you're Andhra, but what happens in your next life? You don't even know if you're going to be a human being. Hmm? So, <laughs> we may become a big celebrity, we may have our PhD, we may get a lot of prestige, we may have a happy family, we may have a good job, career, security, all the things we desire, but how long can you hold on to them? You cannot. They will be taken, well, Tamal Krishna Goswami used to say, one of three things, or two of three things, or all three things may happen. What are those things? You will get what you hanker after and you will lose it because everything is temporary in this world. That's one possibility. So you'll be frustrated through loss, including loss of, the, of your loved ones, including loss of your own body, or loss of your mind. <laughs> that also happens. Well, it happened to my mother. She's 83, she's got dementia now, and she can't remember anything. She has a memory of about two, three days. That's it. Beyond that, she can't remember anything. See? So the mind will also disintegrate at one point and you will lose, your synapses will all start to misfire and nothing will work anymore and it's, you don't, you, you, we cannot be so proud of what we're, what we're presently so enamored by because it won't be forever. These are borrowed plumes. They're coming as a result only of our previously performed actions. It's called prad of the karma. And as soon as that karma runs out, lo and behold, so does everything that we're proud of. Meanwhile, what have we done? We've run up a large bill on our karmic credit card. And Yamaraj has to tap us on the shoulder at the time. He says, excuse me, sir, we need to discuss your debits. 
Uh, we've stepped on so many toes to preserve this false ego that we're so enamored by, to, to, to get the prestige that we so ardently seek in this world, to get the money. This is a big one, isn't it? Khas kar bharat me. Aisa lagta hai. Ki, that the money is such an appealing thing. Huh? That's what we come here for. This. The Prabhupada says some heavy things about this that I won't even repeat, actually. But most people come to America to make money. Maybe not so much anymore because America is not the greatest place to make money anymore. Kind of burnt out. One of my god brothers said, America's run. The tank is empty, but the, it's running on fumes still for some time. No more petrol, but the fumes are keeping the car going. And it's like, a, you know, most insightful people can see that America is pretty much in that position. Certainly the Chinese see it. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, so nothing, nothing that we can be proud of or that we can be attached to in this world, we, can, we can't hold on to it, it's temporary. And so we can get what we want so bad, like when we're little children, you know, we want something, you've got to have it now. Uh, and those of you who have children, you've experienced this phenomenon. <laughs> They've got to have it. I don't know what the thing is now, but, uh, you know, several years ago it was Tommy the Train, and they have to have it. They've just got to have it. So we get what we want and we lose it, or we never get what we want. If you don't have the karmic, you know, what we call the punya, if you don't have a uh, if your credit line doesn't extend far enough in the karmic scale of things, then you can never get what you want. Hmm? You may want to play the murdanga so nicely, but if you don't have the karma, you're never going to do it, no matter how hard you study and work. <laughs> huh? We may want to have a million dollars, and no matter how hard we break our back working, we don't get one penny more than is already written on our forehead when we're, when we're born. You look at your astrological chart, you can understand what the likelihood is. You can save yourself a lot of needless struggle. Because it's guaranteed, Prahlad Maharaj says, the amount of uh, sukha that you get and the amount of dukkha that you get in this life, the Pradhapad Karma, it's already slated. It's already been taken care of. There's nothing you can do to change it. And it, it's inexorable. So you can get what you can... Um, Get what you want and lose it, or you can maybe never get what you want and you remain frustrated. And then the third possibility is that you get what you want and you're actually capable of enjoying that thing also, but then you realize that it's really not all that it's cracked up to be, is it? <laughs> Just like when we're children, when we've got to have Tommy the train, then uh, you know you grow up and you lose interest. How many parents have experienced this? <laughs> the toys are rotting in the corner ignored. The ones that you spent money for and in trouble and anyway, so this is our position because we are not actually of this world. We are we actually have eternal, limitless aspirations for unending knowledge and unending bliss. But we're trying to pursue those in an environment where there's limitation imposed on us at every step of the way. There's limitation imp imposed on our time. The clock is ticking, and we've only got a certain amount of time to stay here. It's also said in the Shastras, everybody has a finite number of breaths that are already decided, even before you're born. So you cannot stay here forever. And we, although we desire to be fully aware, because knowledge is power, it's said, right? If you're aware of what's what and who's who, then you can do things accordingly, right? But we have limitations are imposed in that way as well. Some people are born very intelligent, some people are not. It depends on the karma, once again. And bliss, this is the big thing. That you know, Mainly the, the, the main uh, energy of the Lord that we are envious of is his pleasure potency. We want to have that potency for ourselves. We want to always be enjoying and never have to suffer. This is what we actually aspire for. And this is what all the work we do is for. This is why we seek out family life. This is why we, everything that we're doing is to try to seek some, what we call in Sanskrit, rasa. Rasa means the taste that keeps us going. Mm -hmm. So these three things, they're called sat, chit, ananda in Sanskrit. Eternal existence, full awareness, and total ecstasy. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? 
Now our material body that we're, that we're misidentified with right now, it's made out of you know, blood, pus, fat, stool, bone marrow, hair, uh, all these ugly things, perspiration, right? <laughs> They're not really very nice. There's, when I was in, uh, where was it, in Hawaii, we went to a Buddhist temple and they had these murals on the wall of the temple, some, something like we have in Kalachanji's hallway there, except it was showing various episodes of the Buddha's life. So, you know, he walked through this place where it was like some sort of a harem or something. There's all these women who had all passed out from a night of partying, intoxication, right? And all of them are half-dressed and they're all snoring and some of them are passing air and just it's a totally disgusting scene. Totally disgusted by it. He said, this is really the essence of this physical enjoyment, at least a gross sense gratification that enamors us uh, in material existence, sex life. This is really the essence of it and it's disgusting. It's disgusting. So this is, this is what we're settling for. <laughs> we could have Satchit Ananda, like Krishna has it, but we're settling for this filthy, stinky, you know, hairy bag of bloody, pussy, fatty, you know, all the things that rot, while you're still in it, mind you. You can't hear anything properly anymore. You can't, you know, t go, to the, go to see the deity now. How do you know you'll be able to see him next month? You may be blinded. At least by the time you're 83, like my Mata, then you cannot see anything anymore either. I took her to the temple when I was there taking care of her for about four years. I was taking her to the temple nearly every weekend, and I don't think she ever saw the deities. <laughs> she just, she couldn't see. She wanted to hear the lecture very much. She said she was very interested. She liked it. But most of the time she just couldn't hear. She just couldn't hear it. The senses had rotted by that time. So, Jabalagataname tapana vyapai, tabalagakari hari seva, one poet wrote. <laughs> very good thing. You, as long as your senses are in working order and everything's okay, Use it now for the, t for the service of Lord Hari because you don't know that this opportunity is guaranteed later on. And just like people, they, sometimes they come and ask me about spiritual master and it, it's understood that if someone is serious about Krishna consciousness, he has to accept the spiritual master. So I always advise people, take as much association as you can of your spiritual master because it's not guaranteed that you will have that opportunity in the future. I know. We didn't actually believe that Srila Prabhupada would, would leave this world because he was so extraordinary in every other way that we, there, was, there was every reason to believe that he was able to put off death indefinitely. And yet he didn't. <laughs> he left this world in 1977. And we also, more recently, we lost Tamal Krishna Goswami, very dear to all of us. The, the opportunity is not there. So even if you are only going to use your senses for sense gratification, you don't have that time. You don't really have the opportunity. You're going to lose it guaranteed. That is guaranteed, as sure as death, as they say. Hmm? So Krishna's body is Satchidananda, and our, the body with which we're pr currently identifying is Asat, that is to say temporary. Uh, achid, ignorant, and nirananda, without the ecstasy that we seek. Now, I said before that we could have Satchidananda, so how is that? We actually, we are Satchidananda, just like the Lord. Just like you have a drop of water out of the ocean, it has all the same con constituent elements as the ocean water has, but in very small degree. So that's us. We're like a drop of water out of the ocean, or another analogy is given, like a spark out of the fire. You know, a spark has the same heat and light, the properties are the same, but in very minute degree. So in the same way, our real body, not this false body, this temporary body that we didn't know a hundred years ago, th our real body is actually just like the Lord's. It's Satchitananda. And if we function on the platform of our real identity, then we can have that eternity, knowledge, and bliss that we seek. So what's keeping us from that? Basically, ignorance. Because on account of misidentification, through mainly bad association in this world, we, we maintain this envious attitude towards the Supreme Lord and don't want to, don't want to um, partake of Satchitananda on his terms. <laughs> That's really what it comes down to. He's the Supreme and we're not, and we really can't handle that right now. We, we have an attitude adjustment problem. 
So that's what this material world is meant for, Maya Devi. It's, it's like when the children are, are, are nonsense, the parent gives the, the children, the naughty children, to a stern uncle for discipline. <laughs> so Krishna does this also. He gives this to Auntie Maya. <laughs> Maya Mosa. <laughs> so this is, this is our situation in this material world. But when Krishna comes, he doesn't come through the... He doesn't, he's not impelled by karma the same, that, the same way that we are. Because he's not conditioned by the ignorance that makes karma relevant. Only because of the ignorance that we voluntarily partake of, then we have to abide by Maya's terms, you see? So we have two choices. If we, if we choose to, the mind, and the mind is like a toggle switch, right? On the mental platform, we can only choose yes or no. There are two functions of the mind, at least in terms of Sankhya. Nowadays in modern psychology, I think they kind of mix up the mind and the intelligence. They don't have a real clear distinction. But in Sankhya philosophy, there is a distinction between the mind and the intelligence. The mind only does two things. What is that? It Sankalpa, it accepts something, or uh, Vikalpa, it rejects something. That's all. That is the only thing that the mind does. It gives the yea or the nay <laughs> on whatever the intelligence and the senses present to it. You see? The mind is the ultimate veto agent, right? Has ultimate editing privileges. The mind. Now the intelligence, it tells us, you know, how things are operating and it gives us all the raw data that we need to work with. But ultimately the mind is there. Now when the, the mind is the disciple of the false ego, so if the, if the false ego, if we're in the clutches of this bad partner, a, a, a partner in crime you might say, if we choose to keep the company of a false ego instead of our real identity, then we get thrown into this school of hard knocks for attitude adjustment. And we have to suffer on account of the fact that everything here is temporary. So we are impelled in this way, by our own choices, bad choices. It's like children, you give them choices. If you do this, you're going to have to stand in the corner. And if you do that, I'm going to give you rasgula. <laughs> right? So you give the children choices, and then they, 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 they themselves decide what to do. Krishna has the same system. He, he doesn't force this down anyone's throat, but he, he makes it very clear, at least in Bhagavad Gita. Um, now here he's making something else very clear. For those of us who are thinking about maybe uh, working on Krishna's terms instead, <laughs> of trying to evade him or exploit him, because these are the two things uh, we can do. In the realm of karma, uh, you know, fruit of activity, materialistic pursuits, we try to exploit Krishna's resources. Or, and sometimes if we're sahajis, we try to exploit Krishna himself. We try to enjoy him. Um, and in the realm of Gyan, that's when we try to evade Krishna. We either deny him outright, like the Buddhists do, or we just say that he's, he's so completely um, bereft of any kind of uh, sentience that he's not relevant anymore, which is basically what the Mayavadis do, the impersonalists. So we exploit or we evade Krishna's energies as long as we're conditioned by maya. But when we choose to turn to Krishna, then all the enlightenment comes. And when we make that decision, this verse becomes relevant. Krishna says, May uh, janma karma divyam. My janma and my karma, they are transcendental. I am not forced to appear here the way that you people are. Krishna is telling us, I come by my own sweet will, because I'm divya, I'm transcendental. Hmm? And one who can understand this through becoming equally transcendental, through the process of uh, yoga, yoga means what? What does yoga mean? Huh? To connect, very good. The, the, the dhatu is yukt, uh, yuj, to, to connect, to join. When we join Krishna's side, uh, then, we, then we can, there's, there's a question of yoga. Hmm. Just as an interesting aside here, <clears throat> one of Srila Prabhupada's godbrothers uh, gave a very interesting analogy for the name of Vinayaka. Who is Vinayaka? Ganesh, right? Ganapati. Do anybody know why, they, why is he called Vinayaka? Huh? Vinayaka, what does it mean, literally? Huh? Uh, that would be Vigna Vinashana, no? 
V Nayaka. He's Nayaka means a leader, right? He's leading us. V. What does V mean? Nope. Nope. Very good. Who said this? It means Vigatanaya. <laughs> Vigatanaya V. He leads us in the opposite direction. So Ganesha is removing material obstacles, but what does that do? That encourages you on the wrong path, right? So the real Ganesh, uh, because sometimes in the old nectar devotion, I don't know if it's been edited out or not, but um, Prabhupada wrote that one should worship Vaikuntha deities like Ganesh. He actually meant Vishwaksena. Vishwaksena is the Vaikuntha counterpart of Ganesh. And, and where do we know Vishwaksena? For those who are chanting Vishnu Sasranama, anybody know? Shuklam Bharadharam Vishnu Shashavaranam Chaturbhujam Prasanna Vadanam Dhyayat Sarva Vignopashantaye. This is Vishwaksena. You see? He's also Vignavanashana. But he's not leading you in the wrong direction, he's leading you, leading you in the right direction towards Krishna, towards Vishnu, devotional service. Um, so this is the idea, that as long as we've made the choice to turn towards Krishna instead, and if we're properly guided, then we can remove the onion layers, <laughs> so to speak, that are covering us over. What are those layers? Well, I mentioned already, we have the false ego first, then the intelligence, then the mind, and then comes the ether, and then the air, and uh, you know, there's these five elements that, that make this material body. As long as we hang on to our false ego, we're going to definitely be attached to this material body, misidentify, misidentifying with the body. The Bhagavatam Rishabha David calls this karmatmaka mana, the mind colored by fruitive activities. Our mind will be completely polluted with this, in, with this fruitive um, intent. And as long as that's the case, we have to take another material body. Moreover, once you do take the material body in that spirit of false ego, then what happens? Nunam pramatta kurute vikarnama yet indriya pritaya aprinoti. To please these bad masters that are the senses. <laughs> They're driving us here and there, right? The tongue tells us to eat this, eat that. Even if the intelligence tells us otherwise, how is it so? People eat junk food, isn't it? Anybody with half a brain knows that junk food is bad for you. Even the people who eat it know that it's bad for you. But what happens? The, the senses are telling them, no, 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 you have to do this. Your, your happiness depends on eating French fries, right? Or even worse, some people go to McDonald's. Do you see? Just because the tongue is, you know, so insidious, and, and you know, anyway, that's... <laughs> Yet indriya priyataya aprinoti. When we are convinced that we are this material body, then we have to do what the body orders. We have to do it. We do, we pra practically speaking, we forfeit our free will. To the extent that the false ego cements us into this psychophysical identity, false ego. You know, even you know, notwithstanding that the fact that the intelligence is telling you, you don't want to do this. You know. Notwithstanding the fact that the intelligence maintains its position throughout the entire process, notwithstanding the fact that we can see that I cannot be this body because I won't be this body in 2,000 years. <laughs> it's going to be gone. So who am I really? You see? So once we become wrapped up in this, what we call karma bandhana, a karmic uh, entanglement, then we practically have to commit sinful activities, which is like what? It's like maxing out your credit card. We need to go back to our uh, financial uh, analogy here. You have to get financial to keep people's interest. So, unless it's an American audience, then you have to get sexual to keep their interest. Right? <clears throat> anyway, so then this is the idea that... <clears throat> Once we are embedded in this false ego, then we, practically speaking, have to commit sins, and those sins, they, not only do they keep us in material bondage, but they cover us even more. They make it, they, it's like a vortex. They pull us deeper and deeper into this ignorance. It makes the problem worse and worse and worse. And this is why all the acharyas preach that the sense gratification process is like drinking poison voluntarily. Janiya shunya bishakainu. Narutam Das Thakur says, 
This is why. It leaves a trace on your mind, on your psychology. On, it's called samskar. It, it leaves an imprint there that makes the tendency to repeat that activity even, even more appealing to the mind. Right? The mind is already terrorized enough by the senses and the false ego. Huh? But then when you engage in sinful activity in particular, eating meat, illicit sex, gambling, intoxication, that makes the, that, that just, it, it, it case hardens the tendency to commit those activities once again. Makes it all the more difficult to come up. You see? Therefore, Krishna says in chapter 7, Bhagavad Gita, Yesham Tvantagatam Papam Jananam Punya Karmanam Te Dvanva Moha Nirmukta Those people who are determined to act only in pious ways and who have eradicated the reactions of their past sins. Te Dvanva Moha Nirmukta They become freed from the moha that is the result of that dualistic uh, uh, false ego. They become free from that, and therefore they don't have to suffer so much. They won't misuse their minute freedom any, anymore. They can sustain a mature commitment to devotional service, to Krishna consciousness, on the spiritual platform. So piety helps. It's a big help. But any kind of rebirth in this mature world, it's, it's going to be suffering. And once we're here, we practically have to get entangled, even if we're pious. Who's the famous example of this? Very pious king, but on the, on the, on the, on, what does Prabhupada say? There are accidents even on royal roads. He gave a cow in charity to a brahmana. This is King Nriga, described in the Bhagavatam. And then that cow wandered out of the pasture and into another brahmana's land, uh, and into another, back into the king's uh, flock of cows, herd of cows. And then the king, you know, he's got so many cows, he couldn't recognize that I already gave this cow. Then he gave the cow to another Brahmin. Then meanwhile, the first Brahmin came back and said, hey, that's my cow. <laughs> and and Maharaj Nikra said, well, I, you know, I did, I'm sorry, I didn't. And this Brahmin, he was very upset, and he cursed him, you should become a lizard. He said, this is the most sinful thing, you're giving a cow in charity, and then you take it back from somebody. He didn't, evidently, he didn't believe him or something. Who knows? <clears throat> so even he did the right thing, <laughs> too much of a good thing is bad. <laughs> Even he was doing the right thing, but there are accidents. We, as long as we're conditioned by maya, then we make mistakes. We become illusioned. And most of the time, we even cheat. <laughs> huh? And the senses are imperfect as well, so we can't figure out, figure out our own way to get out. We totally depend on the helping hand. There are many stotras. They mention this karavalambam, right? The helping hand of the Lord. We totally depend on that. What's another nice analogy? It's relevant in California. Here, I don't, you don't really have this problem, but in California, you get wildfires every year. Every single year. It burns down half the state sometimes. Like, what was it, 2008, I think it was. You know, I was in Temecula at that time in Southern California, and the sky was orange. It was a mix, it was a, it was dirty orange color, and everywhere you had the smell of smoke. And I was, you know, at least a hundred or more miles away from the fire, <laughs> which was pretty much everywhere, all the, the whole southern half of the state. So when we're in a fire of that magnitude, they really can't do anything about it. Californians can relate with this. I don't know, Texans, you know, maybe you have to talk tornadoes here. Um, but th there's nothing they can do about it. The only thing that can save you is rain. And the only place the rain comes from is where? God. <laughs> huh? So, we say, Sangsara Davana Lali Haloka, those people who are oppressed by the forest fire of material existence, there's nothing they can do. But, Tranaya Karunya Ghanaghanatvam, the mercy cloud of, of the spiritual master. Krishna sends so many spiritual masters out to pull us out, to save us, in the form of this rain, rain of mercy. Where does the rain come from? Where does the rain come from? Ocean. It's pulled out of the ocean by the sun, eva and evaporated, forms clouds, and then it rains. So this, the ocean is like Krishna. Kalyana Gunarnava, the ocean of auspiciousness, is Krishna. Vande Guru Sri Charanadavindam. So Krishna 
We have our Satchidananda Vigraha, we have our own spiritual body uh, that has been double clicked right now. We're not really in touch with it. It's there, but it's, it's, it's just not really functioning in a very, we're not conscious of it. We've, we've set it aside and we're absorbed in things that we are not instead. But Krishna is not like that. When Krishna comes, he comes of his own volition. He doesn't come through the agency of maya. He doesn't even take a body made out of these five elements of earth, water, fire, air, ether. He retains his satchidananda vigraha. But he does it in such a way that, as Rupanuga Prabhu said, nato natya thoro yatha, just like a dancing actor on a stage. He puts on a very good show. He acts like a perfect uh, human being. Um, at least as Ramchandra he does. As Krishna, he's a little bit more <laughs> troublesome. He's Nartakarta Makhana Chor. And uh, so many things Krishna does. That's why in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Kaunteya Pradijani Hiname Bhakta Pranashyati. You declare it that my devotee never perishes because if I say it, they won't believe me. <laughs> Those who are experienced won't believe me. Maybe the naive will believe him. Uh, you, want, you want to get the straight story, you go to Ramchandra or Bhagavan Vishnu. But Krishna, he's, he's a little crooked. That's part of his appeal. Everybody likes a crook, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it? It's like on television. It's all about crooks, isn't it? Those are the really popular shows, right? What is it? I don't know what they have nowadays, but you know, I'm sure it's still the same as it always has been. So this is, this is why it's important to study this verse. When Krishna comes and performs whatever leelas he performs, because sometimes he does some pretty far out things. He takes someone else's wife in the dead of night. He is stealing, I mean, stealing butter, that's not a big deal. We like that. Um, but if somebody steals our wife, then hey, you're, 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 you're invading my space. I mentioned the, the, this morning also that one, one man came and he became a Christian. He was an Indian, he became a Christian. He said, I don't like to worship Krishna because he's an immoral God. And uh, Prabhupada said, how so? He said, well, he, he dances, he takes others' wives. He, he dances with others' wives, the gopis. <clears throat> so Prabhupada very patiently explained that, well, every, actually everything in the creation belongs to Krishna. All living entities are his expansions. All the gopis are his... Uh, expansions as well, expansions of his pleasure potency. All the material elements with which everyone's body is constructed, that's also Krishna's property. So even the conditioned souls, they're also Krishna's property. Even the wives in the material existence, are all, they all belong to Krishna. And even your wife belongs to Krishna. Therefore, you are committing adultery. <laughs> you see? Simple logic. I mean, he didn't quote any Shastras or anything. It's just simple logic, because this is the nature of realization. This is the nature. Therefore, I said in the beginning, experience is everything. If you experience, if you're living this thing, this Krishna consciousness, then you get this understanding. It automatic, not automatically comes, but it comes by Krishna's mercy. Teisham satati yuktanam pajatam priti purvakam dadami buddhi yogam tam. This is what Krishna says. So let's do this. Let us take to Krishna consciousness and we can actually understand really tattvataha, the transcendental nature of Krishna's appearance in this world. We, we can get a better sense of the significance of Janmashtami. Not only of Krishna's, he, he, two things he mentions here, his Janma is one thing, that's Janmashtami, but his Karma is another thing. Why he does what he does. For whom does he do it? He actually does it for us <laughs> only. That's his only purpose. Although he himself says earlier, this is like a public, uh, pol pu public uh, you know, proclamation. I come here to reestablish dharma and to deliver the, the saintly, right? I come to reestablish religion. This is what Krishna says. But actually his real purpose is to come and enjoy pastimes with his devotees and to attract new devotees. In uh, Paris, <clears throat> when Srila Prabhupada opened the ISKCON temple in Paris, France, uh, some 30 or 40 years ago. He named the deity Sri Sri Radha Parasishwara. And Prabhupada was telling the devotees there that Krishna has come to Paris now because he wants to get some French gopis. <laughs> you see? So there's some truth in that. <laughs> On a certain level, that's true. Because every one of us has something that only we can give to Krishna, and Krishna wants that thing only. 
Whatever's the most dear thing, he wants that thing. He doesn't want the thing that, 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 that you know, whatever's the most dear, that, that he wants the core essence of who you are. That's what he wants. He doesn't care about anything else because he gave you everything else. <laughs> All we have is the decision. Remember I said on the mental platform, we have this toggle switch, yes or no. All we have is, to, is, is, is the ability to choose. Am I going to serve Maya and, and come un, under the direct supervision of my senses and my material body and my false ego under her agency? Or am I going to go the other way and serve Krishna and work directly under the protection of Daivi Prakriti, Krishna's uh, Atma Maya, the very same Atma Maya that arranges his own appearance? You see? We can also become as transcendental as Krishna in this way, and our janma and our karma can become as transcendental as Krishna's. I quoted this this morning from Padma Purana. Uh, what is it? <clears throat> see if I can remember. I don't know the verse. I just read it in the Tika this morning. Uh, Jiva Goswami says that... Uh, karma bandhana janmacha vaishnavanam Navidyate, something to that effect. That there is no such thing as karmic bondage for the Vaishnava, and there is no such thing as mundane birth for the Vaishnava. Just as much as Krishna is transcendental, Hari or he nirguna sakshat, as much as Hari is nirguna, beyond the modes of material nature, so the devotee can also become beyond those modes. Even though, even though living in a material body, that body is spiritualized in exactly the same way that a hot furnace will turn a metal rod, you know, first red hot, then white hot. What happens if you take a hot, white hot metal rod and throw it on a pile of straw? What will happen? The metal rod acts like fire, doesn't it? Even though it's not fire, you see? So this is the analogy given. When we become completely Krishna conscious, then this body, which, is, which was created out of our karma, has become so transcendentalized, so spiritualized, that it ceases to act in the, on the karmic level at all. It's like an engineer. Some of you are no doubt engineers. So an engineer can use the same system to heat a building or to cool a building. <laughs> so Krishna, for him, it's the same energy. He can do this. So he does this with himself, and even his devotee can become similarly transcendental, and that's what Krishna Leela is. When Krishna comes and dances with these gopis, it is a purely transcendental event. It is not impelled by lust, anger, greed, or any of the other things that uh, oppress those of us who are in the bodily misconception of life. It is instead a transcendental display of pure love, and it is intended solely to attract those of us who are suffering in material existence with the wrong idea. So this is the significance, at least this is some of the significance of Janmashtami and Krishna's appearance in this world gives us some things to think about. There's much, 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 much more than this. And in fact, I didn't even read the whole purport, so that's just uh, tangible proof, but um, I'll stop here. I don't know what time it is. About 8 o'clock, we're right on time. Anybody have any questions or comments? Uh, Jai Keshava Prabhu? <clears throat> Speaking of? You're saying how it's already here, you can't change it. Can you, can you tie it to the science or the, the verse? <laughs> right, this is a very good question. He says that when we're dealing with prarabdha karma, prarabdha karma means that karma which is on the docket for you to enjoy or suffer in this life only. Because there's more karma waiting if you're in the karma, you know, if you're in the system of karma, <laughs> if you've got good credit in this material world, so to speak. There's more karma waiting for you in another life, but for this life, whatever's written on your forehead, you cannot change that. says, It's considered to be that you've got some you know, barcode or something written on your forehead. That only the demigods can read it. Right? We don't see it. <laughs> um, at the same time, the Brahma Samhita mentions for the, that for the devotee, karmani nirdahati, they, 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 their karma is burnt up. So this is the idea that um, although in material existence there's no way you can get out of your karma. It's just like this. The analogy is sometimes given. When you get on an airplane and that airplane is, say, going to New York or, uh, you know, whatever, 
then as soon as they shut those doors and the plane takes off, you are not going to get out of that plane unless you're in New York or unless you're insane or barring an act of Al-Qaeda. <laughs> so karma is like that. It is inexorable. You can't overcome it. But when you practice devotional service, then Krishna himself can intervene and take you out of that whole thing altogether. It's kind of like when you're imprisoned. What's one thing you can do if you're a death row prisoner? What's your only hope? You can't go to appeal your case. You've already been tried and sentenced. Let's say it's already gone. Supreme Court says you're also guilty. Then what do you do? Huh? There's one thing left. What is it? Any lawyers here? Huh? Yeah, you get a pardon from the governor or from whoever the highest uh, you know, authority of the governmental authority is. If you get that person's uh, pardon, then you can get out. So that's what we're doing in Krishna consciousness. Hmm? In that sense, it's said that the karma is burnt up, although ordinarily you can't do so. And Rup Goswami also says, just by the not only pure chanting, because there's different stages of chanting. You know, we, we chant Hare Krishna, but we also do so many other things that we're not supposed to do, <laughs> right? You see, so where's the taste? And this is why we don't have such strong faith, because, hey, wait a minute, I know this Hare Krishna thing, and, you know, I'm, I'm still, I still think Maya's better than Krishna. <laughs> I mean, frankly, this is our attitude. So the reason for that is that we are not chanting the name purely. When we are chanting with the right attitude, remember I said attitude, experience, they all go to, yeah, I mean, you have to do this, actually and then you get the result. So when we do that, when we actually have chanted the name purely, then we begin to realize that this Harinam is also Satchirananda Vigraha. Hmm? And when that happens, then Rupa Goswami says, even before that happens actually, even if you're chanting, in the, even if you're sincerely trying to chant, but because of bad habits, you're not completely perfect. Even at that stage, uh, much of your Prabhupada karma, as much as Krishna wants, it will be wiped away. You see? So that's, that's our whole process. Now you understand the principle of mercy here and how absolutely essential and central it is. It's not a mechanical process. It's a very personal thing. We're going to Krishna and we're chanting his holy name and we're begging for something. So if we're going to go to a wealthy man, you have to know what to ask for. Don't say, let, you know, don't go in front of the deity and say, Can, may my daughter pass her medical exam. Or may we get the new Lexus? Or can we move to, what is it now? I guess, well, Flower Mound. <laughs> These are the wrong things because while we have this short human life, tadapi adhruvam arthadam. It's, it's, it's very short, but it's very valuable because you can actually get out of this whole cycle of repeated birth and death. You can actually get out of karma bandhan altogether. You can overcome the false ego that is oppressing you and, and, and driving you on like a, like a slave driver. You can overcome that thing. And how do you do that? By chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. But don't expect it to be easy. Because it's like, you know, Prabhupada often says to try to become Krishna conscious is like, you know, declaring war on Maya. If you go, Devamrita Maharaj gave this analogy, very nice. You know, unlike Krishna, we are actually in the prison house. So what happens when one prisoner tries to make a prison break? Then what happens? The entire authority of that prison system is focused on one individual. There is a very concentrated search. All the people with their weapons drawn, I mean, they, they just mobilize them instantly and, and, and focus on stopping that person from getting out. Is it not a fact? You see? So when we, when, we when we decide to become Krishna conscious, it's like walking up to Maya and saying, slapping her in the face and saying, I'm out of here. <laughs> what do you think is going to happen? Therefore, you really have to take shelter of Krishna. If you, if you, if you play with each of them, neither one of them is going to take you very seriously. You see? I was in Kmart, and uh, <clears throat> because it's Kmart, I was having trouble getting someone to help me. So then I noticed that the sales personnel had a, had a little name tag there. So I thought, let me, let me just check out the power of Nam. <laughs> so I vibrated that person's name, and instantly I had that person's attention. Instantly. She was at my service. Well, yes, can I help you? you know? So this is the idea. When we call Krishna's name, he will come. 
he will give us, yes, what can I do for you? And if you, at that point, if you just say, well, I, you know, can, can you, um, um, can you, can you, can you get me a new Lexus? <laughs> the Christian will say, oh, what a relief. That's all you want? No problem. I thought you were going to ask for me. That's really dangerous. People who are here, what was it, maybe last Sunday, I think, we were talking about Krishna's weakness. <laughs> yeah. If you understand Krishna has this one weakness, that is that he is really a sucker for pure love. If you, if you present him with pure love, he will do anything you want. He's so eager to have this. He's so eager to have this. And for that reason, Rupa Goswami says, bhakti is very rarely given. Because Krishna knows if um, Krishna Karshani is Rupa Goswami's word in the Nectar of Devotion, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, it, it, is, it controls Krishna. Krishna comes under the control of pure love. Just like he's called Radha Vinod, right? Radha Vinod means he's virtually the plaything in the hands of Srimati Radharani. Because she is the highest embodiment of that love. You see? So to the extent that we have pure love for Krishna, to that extent Krishna becomes at our beck and call. And he's going to be very careful about who he lets to do that. Right? He's going to make sure that person is very trustful. I mean, we do this, isn't it? We do this. Do we think Krishna is such a fool that he's going to give himself so easily? No. But this, that, that's discouraging, you know, if I, if I emphasize that. Let's emphasize the fact you know, that how much Krishna wants this thing, he really, really wants it. It's been my experience, I have a few decades of experience that I can speak from, 30 years or more of practicing Krishna consciousness. I can say that my observation has been that it's very, very difficult uh, for someone to really be kicked away from the process of Krishna consciousness. A person basically really has to be deliberate about that. And uh, because Lord Chaitanya is very, very merciful. And unless one is a complete aparadhi, or unless one is really just a thorough reprobate, um, I, I've seen that you know people can always come around. We don't need to mention names or anything, but it's just you, if you stick with this process, you will <laughs> get the same realization. So therefore, it's so easy. All we have to do is take some time, maybe five minutes a day, and chant this maha mantra. Not, we're not, it's not party policy that we're calling this the Mahamantra. This is the uh, uh, Upanishad says this. Which Hari Santana Upanishad. This is Shruti Mantra. It mentions the Hare Krishna Mahamantra as the topmost method, especially in this age of Kali Yuga. So please let us all chant seriously. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram. In Vrindavan, there was one sadhu. And he was saying, if you call to Krishna, he will come to you. Your friend will come to you. Call to your friend Krishna. He's your friend. If you call to your friend, he will come to you. He will always come. So please try this. Please do it. Okay, anybody else? Any, any, continue. Well, you were saying that, oh, cool. If you don't want to know somebody, you know, like Krishna has the right to reveal himself or not. So do we. Right. Mm -hmm. So then when it comes to bhakti, we may all be practicing bhakti, but then Krishna still ha reserves that right to reveal himself to us. So what's the guarantee? And does that stop us from going further? Or this is my the guarantee is the word of the spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada. And Srila Prabhupada said that if you take one step towards Krishna, he will take ten steps towards you. That's why I say we need to emphasize the greed that Krishna has for this bhakti. He is so hungry for it. Why does he want butter? This is something that Madhya Shoda is completely perplexed by. She's got the best cows of Rajamandala, and let me just, this is in the 10th canto in, in his commentary, Srila Prabhupada explains this at some length. Madhya Shoda keeps certain top breed cows in a certain cow pen separate from the other cows. And she only feeds those cows the most fragrant grasses and herbs and nice things. Um, I don't know in other places in India, but in Mumbai you get this lemon grass. Everybody know what this is? It, it tastes like lemon, and so they, you know, when you feed the cows with this thing, then the milk comes out with this flavor. <laughs> so Madhya Shoda does this. So she's got the best milk products, and I mean, she is the wife of the king of Raja. Nobody has better facility than Nanda Yashoda. 
And she's taking these milk products and she's turning it into nice ghee. And then, you know, those who are traditional cooks, they know that you can also flavor ghee in certain ways and make it very nice. Um, ginger ghee is one thing Yomana Devi taught how to make and so many other things. You can do so many nice things with milk products. What to speak of saffron sandesh or rabri you get in Vrindavan or perda, matura perda is famous, rasgulas in Bengal. Everybody, you know, milks, it's just infinite. So Yashoda has all these things for Krishna's pleasure and yet she finds him perpetually stealing from the other gopis. <laughs> she can't figure it out. Now if Krishna were just impelled by, you know, greed for, you know, trying to satisfy the tongue, impelled by the mode of passion as we see in this material world, you know, it just doesn't make sense calculating it in those terms. The only explanation that makes sense is that Krishna wants more love, even more love. And we see this particularly in the Govardhan Lila, because no matter how many foodstuffs they brought, it's called Annakuta, a mountain of, of grains and foodstuffs virtually to rival Giridaj Govardhan himself. And they offered. And yet Krishna said, what? Bring more, bring more. <laughs> So he wants it so much. That's our, that's our saving grace. And uh, as I said, understanding Krishna's weakness, now we can get him. You, you can do it. This, is, this thing is doable. It can be done. We've seen examples, even in recent history. You know? Prabhupada said, I'm one Indian. I took the order of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu seriously a little bit. What happens if all the Indians do it? Hmm? What is that order? You deliver your country by, to whatever extent is possible, you give them Krishna consciousness. Anything else? Yeah. Okay. Let, uh, she wants to go first. Okay. Oh, you mentioned the story of the king. Uh, <clears throat> by accident, he mm -hmm. uh, gave the cow. I didn't understand that because he wasn't responsible for that. It was just an accident. So how do we come out of that? Things which we don't do it on purpose? This is the great danger of material existence. He committed, uh, the Brahmin was offended on his account. He did give the cow to someone else. The Brahmin had every right to be offended. But it was a mistake. And this is the point. It's just like this. Um, I mean, it is true in the material world, in, in all spheres of life, um, not just karma, but even in terms of vikarma, it's also true. Someone can say, well, I didn't know that if I uh, take drugs and drink alcohol at the same time, I would die. <laughs> I mean, can you tell that to Imaraj? You have to be informed, you see. We make mistakes, and those mistakes are consequential. It's not fair. It's not meant to be fair. This is why I say this is the school of hard knocks of which Maya is the headmistress. Is that okay? You're not happy with that. <laughs> well, the solution is to become Krishna conscious. If you take shelter of Krishna, Krishna promises, for what Krishna's promise is worth, that, uh, you know, yoga kshemam vahamyaham, I'll carry what he lacked, what you lack, and I'll preserve what you have. You see? So it would seem that King Riga was on the karma mark. He was, he was uh, what some people see as playing it safe <laughs> by staying within the realm of karma and trying to keep his nose clean karmically. But you can't do that. You can't do that. Sooner or later, there's, the, Shakespeare said, there's many a slip twixt to the cup and the lip. <laughs> Sooner or later, you, you, you almost have to mess up because that's what it means to be a conditioned soul. We make mistakes. We are illusioned. We have imperfect senses, and sometimes we even cheat, you see? So the real thing is to get out of this conditional existence by taking shelter of Krishna. He promises that I will carry you over Maya, who is otherwise insurmountable, if you surrender unto me. All obstacles you will overcome by my grace, if you listen to me. If you don't listen to me and act out of false ego instead, then you'll be finished. Pretty stern, <laughs> stern warning. Chaitanya Prabhu, you had to comment. Part of that surrender is to accept the shelter of a bona fide spiritual master. Yeah. That's the actual 
way that you take shelter. Take initiation and, and follow the instructions of the spiritual master. Prabhupada himself, when he would be experiencing some special moments with Krishna, the devotees would be overwhelmed by Prabhupada's ecstasy and he would tell them, no, this is by the mercy of my spiritual master, I'm seeing Krishna. So Krishna reveals himself based on our seriousness to execute the order of the guru. Prabhupada says that is the secret of success. Mm. So first we have to find guru, a real bona fide representative of Krishna. We don't do that. If we don't do that and surrender to the guru, then we're not taking shelter of Krishna, according to Krishna. Because he says, Tadviri Pani Patena Pati Prishnina Sevaya. If you want to know the truth, then surrender to the Guru. That's, that's, our, that's the message because otherwise, who are we going to take shelter of? Our mind? It says one who has, what's that saying? One who accepts his own mind as a Guru has a fool for a disciple. <laughs> that uh, we are authorities. Some of us are authorities. We consider ourselves very intelligent, right? We're authorities at taking birth after birth after birth <laughs> after birth after birth. That's our authority. That's our intelligence. The Guru and the Guru Parampara and Krishna, their authority is how to get us out of the material world, out of the cycle of birth and death. So it's all based on the Guru, taking shelter of the Guru. That's why the devotees here chant 16 rounds on their beads and follow the regular principles and try to preach because they know they're pleasing Krishna. Sorry. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this somebody over here had a question. No. Okay. Yeah. Um, Krishna says <clears throat> earlier in the Bhagavad Gita, there is no loss or diminution by following this process, and this will carry you over to the next life. So, but but we see in Kali Yuga there is a degradation of religious principles, whereas according to that statement, we, we should see increase in awareness about Krishna. How would we answer that? Okay. Um, well, the, 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 that when Krishna says there's no loss or diminution on this path, he's talking about individual loss. The nature of this age of Kali Yuga is that you do see this social decline and this general decline in religious practice as, as a whole for everyone. But on an individual basis, to the extent that one takes to Krishna consciousness, Whatever benefit, whatever advancement we make on this path, it's never taken away from us. Even if we do not complete the process of Krishna consciousness in this one lifetime, we can take up again where we left off in the next life. And that's not true of any other process. It's definitely not true of karmic endeavors, and it's not even true of jnana. Uh, so bhakti is the only path that really enables us to do that. If you, if you get, let's say we get 29% of Krishna consciousness in this life, then in the next life we begin working from 30% or 29% and then move on from there. We don't lose it. Whatever spiritual consciousness we get, it, it stays with us. And that's why Krishna elsewhere says in Bhagavad Gita regarding the fate of the fallen yogi, which Arjuna is asking a similar question, what happens to somebody who doesn't really make it all the way? Krishna says, he, he Shuchinam Srimatam Gehi Yogi Prashto Bhijayate. He, um, he takes his birth in a, in a family that is conducive for Krishna consciousness, and um, he continues with the same thing. So this is, the, this is the essential thing to recognize. If we don't make a distinction between Krishna consciousness and ordinary religious piety, or, you know, uh, say, between worshipping Vishnu and worshipping demigods, for example, you know, they're, they're, they look the same, they're the, what we say homological, but they are very different because one of them is a, is, is, involves an essential change of heart at the most fundamental level possible, and the others are just a business transaction, or the others are just a, another kind of mani material manipulation. Okay? So on an individual basis, we can, we, we, there's no loss or diminution, but in Kali Yuga, everybody loses. <laughs> But even in Kali Yuga, it's, it's fortunate. Kalar doshi nirhidajan asti hiko umahad guna. Kirtanari ve Krishna siya mukta bandha param prajet. That although Kali Yuga is an ocean of all sorts of flaws and everything is working against us in this age, 
Still, there's one good thing, which is that simply by this Harinama Mahamantra, simply by chanting, uh, one can get um, freed from all contamination on one hand, and furthermore, he can go back to Godhead on the other hand. So there's, an, there's a ne- the removal of the negative and conferring of the positive through chanting. Yeah. I, I also had, a, uh, Prabhuji mentioned about uh, taking shelter of a guru as the, as the key ingredient, a key aspect of taking shelter as well as executing the order of the guru. Uh, I was reading some uh, articles written by, uh, or lectures said by Gaur Govind Maharaj some time ago. One of the booklets that have been published uh, by Gopalji Publications uh, talks about like how to find a guru. And uh, there, uh, very clearly, the Gaur Gobind Maharaj say that, I mean, we are not the seers. The Guru and the Vaishnavas, they are the seers. We are, who are we to choose a Guru? Who, we cannot see who is a Guru. Mm. So wh- where does that uh, conundrum, I mean, t- leave us? If we can't see who is a Guru, then how do we find our Guru? Yeah. Well, Krishna is within our heart. He's Upadrashtanu Mantacha. He's, in fact, called the... Chaitya Guru, the Guru of the heart. And when Krishna sees that we are sincerely praying and seeking a, a bona fide spiritual master, he will himself lead us to the proper person. In the 10th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, this very famous verse is there, that Krishna as uh, Paramatma himself is coming in the form of the Acharya to us. So the very same person, this is in a Chinja Beda page, you know, how one can be the, the Paramatma and the Jiva soul at the same time in the form of the spiritual master, it's not conceivable. But this, the Paramatma as the spiritual master will come to us. So, yeah, we just, if, if, if we are sincere, we will be guided in the proper direction. And that's and it's another extension of that same principle that we mentioned already. Teisham satat yuktanam bhajatam priti purvakam dadami buddhi yogam tam. So, which, which means to say that if we have a desire for getting a guru, but we haven't found one yet, that means we are not sincere, basically. Does that well, you know what? Someone asked uh, once, I think, um, a famous uh, freedom fighter in India, who was basically the spearhead of the independence movement, and about, you know, his, what do you think about accepting a guru? And he, he, his answer was that I, I believe in that principle, I have respect for that tradition of accepting a guru, but in 30 or 40 years, I haven't been able to find one. So yeah, I would say that if, you're, if you haven't been able to find a spiritual master by the time you're going to die, then that probably means you're more attached to your search than you were for, to the spiritual master. There are many people like that, many so-called seekers who are just att- more attached to searching than they are to finding. <laughs> you see? And on the other hand, I mean, in their defense, you have to admit that there's, there, are many cheater, there are many cheaters also in the pose of gurus who are really just not at all qualified. And um, in fact, the Puranas also say that there are many gurus who are very expert at removing their disciples' wealth, but not their miseries. <laughs> you see? So, you know, it's, it's understandable why people might be hesitant. And in fact, Srila Prabhupada, even though he said he was convinced of his spiritual master's authority and bona fides at the very first meeting, nonetheless, even though he committed himself to that spiritual master and practiced Krishna consciousness, he did so for a decade before he took initiation. And I think the only reason that he could have done that was because he realized that it was such a, such a serious commitment that he just really wanted to maybe set the example, I don't know. So this is a kind of a, you have to balance this, you know. This, it's like we don't have time because we can die any minute and we, have to, we need a sponsor for our soul in order to get into that party of the spiritual world. You know, because <laughs> otherwise, you know, you've got this bouncer at the door who's, you know, Jaya and Vijaya are standing there with clubs not for no reason. 